<laughs> okay, that makes me feel better already. All right. I'll wait for these gentlemen to find their spots. Well, welcome to the Lighthouse. Welcome to the time of fellowship, time of fun. Good day, amen? Yes, amen. amen. It's good to be here. Good to be here. Good to pray with one another, be with one another. She Okay, is everybody awake? Do I have your attention? <laughs> Did that fall on it? Oh, wow. Okay, it's fine. All right. Well, where was I? Okay. Yeah, I was welcoming everybody. Great to be here. Great to be with one another in fellowship and pray with one another. And um, Susan, good to have you here. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. I mean, every time she comes in here, it's like another miracle. I mean, so it's great to see it. And she's wearing green because she missed last Sunday. So she's celebrating St. Patrick's today. And so that's, that's a good thing, right? Uh, we're going to start a new series today, which I think you'll be delighted about. <clears throat> it's uh, the Ten Commandments for today. So we're going to start the Ten Commandments for today. And um, so the first part of this series, obviously it's going to be a ten-part series, is God's blueprint for our success in life. God establishes a, a blueprint in how you and I can be successful in the life that he's given us. <clears throat> and uh, as I was looking at this, I thought, boy, it's interesting. Uh, the Ten Commandments now, they're tearing them down. They're taking them out. They're getting rid of them. You know, they don't talk about them. And I thought, you know what? We need to spend some time really looking at what God said and why he said it. And uh, so that's what we're going to do in the next uh, few weeks. We'll take a break during Palm Sunday and, of course, Resurrection Sunday. But we're going to just go kind of through the Ten Commandments together. And again, the title for today is God's Blueprint for Our Success in Life. And uh, we'll be studying, obviously, Exodus together, Old Testament stuff, which is applicable today. Incidentally, um, when you read the Old Testament, just so you know, it's as important as the New Testament. You know, you don't throw it away. <clears throat> A lot of people think, well, we're not living in the Old Testament. Oh, okay. Um, the Old Testament to me is, uh, well, like, what was, Katie, where are you? Would you? I know you have your mouth full of food, but say it, get up and say it again. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to boss you around. I'm sorry. I thought, you were, I thought you were one of my kids. I'm sorry. Now get up and tell them what you told me this morning. Isn't that good? Yeah. The thing about it is, when you read the Word of God, like I told you a couple weeks ago, I was in Psalms, and it, it was something that I used the entire week about being patient and don't get angry. And I, I just flipped on Psalms. So, the Old Testament is for today. The New Testament is for today. It is the Word of God. And God can speak to us any way he chooses to. So it's very important to understand that. And so, uh, we're, again, we're going to study the Old Testament the, the, of Exodus chapter 20. Before we do, let's pray. Uh, great time of worship, great time of praise. Uh, great to find out about all the missions that we're investing in and the people's lives that we're investing in as well. So let's just pray and ask God's anointing on his word. Our Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time together. I thank you for a time of praise and worship. I thank you for our time of fellowship together. Father, how we can pray with one another, care about one another, and see one another again. So I'm just grateful and thankful for that. We can touch base as a family again. So Father, I ask your anointing on your word. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come, be our teacher, be our guide, illuminate the scriptures to us. May they come alive. May they come alive in our very spirit and soul. And Father, I thank you for the sending us your Holy Spirit to us. I just thank you for that. Thank you for this time. I ask your anointing and blessing on this word. And I ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 says, And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You will have no other gods before me. You will have no other gods before me. So we're obviously starting this new series called the Ten Commandments for today. And um, interesting enough, these are not suggestions. These are not the I, I hope you do them kind of things. They're not kind of a fad. Um, they are the word of God. So it's godly wisdom. And as, as we look at this, um, I want you to think of it a little bit differently, too. It's kind of like a parent talking to their children. C can you think with me about that just for a second? You look at the Ten Commandments, and, and it's kind of like parents who want the best for their kids. And so they're going to give them some instructions and some things that will help them along life's journey. And so as we look at this, it's, it's godly wisdom, but it's kind of like, again, our Heavenly Father is giving you and I directions on how to succeed in life, okay? Real, a real simple plan if we follow it. It'll be a blessing to each one of us. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8, it should be in your notes, I think. Listen, my son, to your father's instructions and do not forsake your mother's teaching, okay? The thing about it is, you notice it's mom and dad in there. It's mom and dad. It's two. It's the father's instructions and your mother's teaching. It's interesting how much mothers teach the children. And how much it's... Uh, Luke comes over and, and I say, hey, Luke, he's four years old. Runs across the backyard, comes up. He comes in and starts running around our house. I say, Lukey, you want a fruit roll up? You want a pretzel? You want some candy? I have to ask mom first. He never says, ever, 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 I have to ask my dad. <laughs> never. Never comes out. He looks very serious at me. I got to ask my mom. So he runs across. Comes. She said yes. Boom. He gets a front row. We're about 15 seconds away. My point being is that the mother's teaching. All right? You get instructions from the dad. That's good. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I'm not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. So as we look at the Ten Commandments, this is, incidentally, you may not know this, but the Ten Commandments are the only thing that the Jews, Muslims, and Christian have in common. They all believe it. Muslims look at the Ten Commandments. Obviously, the Jews do. And Christians they all will agree on that, the Ten Commandments. So it's quite fascinating. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6. These commandments that I have given you today are to be upon your hearts. Be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you are walking along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. The Ten Commandments, the Word of God should always be spoken, always referenced, always thought about constantly. So Roman numeral number one will begin our outline, our study for this morning. Why did God give us the Ten Commandments? Why did God do that for us? So number one, God gave us them to help us, not to harm us. Very important. We have the Ten Commandments there to help us, and they're not there to hurt us. They are, if you will, they're a guideline for life. The Ten Commandments are a guideline for life. Number two, he gave them to us to release us, to release us, and not to hamper us, not to hold us back, okay? To release us. That's interesting, too. How many people do you know that think the Ten Commandments are um, law? Law in such a way that it holds you back, it restricts you. You hear a lot of times people talk about it's the law. Good. I'm glad it's the law. I'm glad it's a guideline. I'm glad it's there. It's there to help us, not hamper us, Amen. not hold us back Amen. from anything. And so the third thing, too, is that he gave them to us to protect us, not punish us. Very important. A real clear-cut example is um, we did this even with Christy and Jeff and Mike. If the stove is on, and the flames are burning. Don't put your hand on it. Don't touch. 
I don't want you to get burned. Now, now think about that just for a minute. Am I doing it for my good or their good? I'm saying, don't touch that. Don't do that because you're going to burn your hand and it's not going to feel good. Now, what do they have? A choice. Kids will be kids. They will experiment. They may touch it anyway. Then they get burned and then you have to comfort them, right? But I mean, so it's there not to punish us, but to protect us. And get this, every time God says, don't do something, he's doing it for our benefit. Yeah. Every single time the word of God says, don't do this, it's for our benefit. And God's lined up all of his principles, um, all these different things for our benefit, not, not to punish us, not to hinder us. And uh, we follow certain laws, certain rules. And it was, yesterday, was it yesterday? Saturday, the baseball game? So yesterday, uh, Luke had his Little League baseball game. Alex. I mean, no, Luke, yeah, Luke is going to be on Sundays. Alex started, he's eight, he just started baseball. He had a game yesterday. So we're watching the game, and uh, so one of the coaches goes out in between innings when the little boys are putting on all their catcher gear. I don't know if you've been to a game or not, but they got gear, head masks, feet masks, toe masks, everything. I mean, they look like a robo. They go out like this. <laughs> And they try to catch, and they can barely move because they got so much equipment on. Well, in between innings, one of our coaches went out behind the home plate, and he warmed up the pitcher. Right? Does that sound all right? The other coach came out and told them to get off the field. He said, don't you know the rules? You are not allowed to warm up your pitcher. Only your catcher can. And that's what he said. Read the rules. That's what the, that's what the coach said. Because the, Alex's college coach said, what are you talking about? The guy said, read the rules. You can't do this. So Aaron said, fine, no problem. I'll go back. My point being is sometimes there's goofy rules. They make zero sense. I mean, well, yeah. But, you know, you may or may not agree with me on this too. The state has laws, don't they? The government has laws, rules, regulations, don't they? Do you like them all? Do you know them all? Do you have them memorized? No. no. <laughs> so, and I, yeah, you care? No. But there are rules. But interestingly enough, for some reason, that particular rule was for the safety of the kids, apparently. I don't know why. But as I looked at state laws and federal laws and different laws, and you, you know, you have stop signs and you're supposed to stop, you have red lights and you're supposed to stop, all of that is for one reason, to, to bring order. Are you with me? Yes. The reason for the whole thing, like them or not like them, state laws, federal laws, uh, immigration laws, I don't care what it is, laws, they're to be followed for one reason, to bring order. Are you with me? The Ten Commandments are given to you and I to bring order into our lives. Amen. To bring order. Amen. To bring, if you want, even accountability in some cases. So I think about this, I thought, wow. God established all these things to give us boundaries, number one, and to bring order into our lives. Otherwise, Life would be chaotic, like the 1960s. Anybody remember the 1960s? Everything was free. Free love, free drugs, rock and roll, and it just goes on and on. And you had a mess, right? You just had an absolute mess. So God comes in and he says, I want to bring order, boundaries into your life for your benefit. Roman numeral number two. Building a solid foundation for a successful life. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. So, hey, what's the principle? Simple. Put God first. It's, it's, it's not complicated. Put God first. Period. So God says, I demand top priority in your life. Not asking about it. I'm telling you, I demand it. Priority in your life. Put me first. 
I deserve to be number one because I have created you, I have set, I've saved you, and I've set you free. So I deserve to be number one. And what does have no other gods really mean? When you think about it, what does that actually mean to you and I? There shall be no other gods before me. And if you look at that, it's a little g, right? It, it's a little g, not a capital. No other gods. So he's talking about these little gods. So the question B is, what is a god? And this is very important. Very, very important. A god is anything that dominates our life. Anything that dominates our life. Now think about that just for a minute. A god is anything that dominates your life. Small g. Um, for some people, a career. Going after a career in life can become a god. You can be obsessed with it. It can dominate your life, your thinking, all the things that go through your life. So even trying to get a good career can turn into a god if you're not careful. Uh, another person, you can idolize a person to being actually destructive in your life. Uh, for some people, money can be a god. You don't think so, but money can be a god. In fact, in the Bible, I think Jesus spent more time talking, or second most, about talking about money in the entire Bible. So some people, that's it. Uh, let me just throw a couple other things out for my son, Mike. It could be skiing, but we're not going to talk about that here publicly. Uh, it could be anything you enjoy, you know. But, but for just, well, fishing is not included in this. It's, it's, it's. So, so let that just slide by, everybody. <laughs> okay, I got caught. All right. So it could, be, it could be any of those kind of things. But, you know, it, you can kind of see in life what can become a God to you. What can, the thing is, what can dominate your life, and you don't even realize that it starts to take first place instead of God. It starts to kind of take priority in your life. It is a priority versus God. Um, interesting little study I'll, I'll share with you. Um, Harvard University did a study on marriage. And um, they did statistics on it, and they said when weddings were done in a church... The couples didn't even have to be Christians. Just if, the, if, a, if a wedding was done inside of a church, the divorces were 1 in 50. Isn't that interesting? 1 in 50 if the wedding was just done in a church. Now, they did another part of the research, and they said uh, if it was a Christian ceremony and that both couples were Christians, the, um, what was the percentage of a divorce would be 1 in 1,000 503 if they were Christians. Pretty interesting, isn't it? 1 in 1,503. Great percentage, isn't it? And so you can kind of see the value that we place in our life as Christians and why God does what he does with us. And so number three, Roman numeral number three. Uh, how do I put God first? How do I put and how do you and I put God first in our life? How do we go about that? And so I took the word first and I just gave a letter for each one, all right? You know, for each, each, each letter. So F stands for finances. F stands for finances. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. So the point here is pretty clear. Put God first in your finances. First thing you think about, God blesses you. So put God first in your finances. And um, God says that it's, I, I didn't think about this, but maybe you do, I don't. But God puts us to the test first and foremost with money. With money. And um, before I even go any further, um, I have zero idea. I've been at this how many years? 40, 50, 45 years? 102 years I've been at this. <laughs> for a long time. And uh, just for your benefit, I have zero knowledge if you tithe. I don't know. I care only because I know God will bless you. 
So I can talk freely about this because I don't know what you give. I don't know if you give 20 cents. I don't know if you tithe 1,000 or 2,000 a month. I don't know. That's between you and God, not Amen. Bill Hill and you and Amen. the church and everybody else. So I can talk pretty freely about this because, again, it's for your benefit. It's for your benefit. But you think about it, and uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about how much money we earn, how we're going to save it, what we're going to do with it. And then I think to myself, I can't take it with me. So why worry about it? I am taking my boat. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but, but seriously, when it comes to money, I mean, you know, we spend a lot of time. So um, I wrote down to myself, what is, why is tithing so important? Why, why does God put this finances in our tithing and giving and putting in the storehouse? And, but if you think about it for just a half of a second, if you all weren't tithers and givers, this church would not be here. There was a couple that came last week. I don't think they're here today, so I can talk about it. Not them. But their church just folded because of finances. They no longer had money from the people to pay the mortgage. The church folded. Gone. And people don't think about that. Who pays for the electricity? Who pays for the, the, well, the carpet? I mean, who pays for all this stuff? You do. God set it up that way. He set up his storehouse. With no money coming in here, we're done. We can go back to meeting in my house. But you will pay for the water. <laughs> right? So it becomes very important. So either the tithing or our giving, it's a way... Uh, I'll tell you this much. There's people in this congregation that are debt-free. And you ask them how they got that way, they learn to become faithful tithers. Amen. Faithful. Never ending, never stopping. What they could give, they gave. And, uh, and again, please, I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on anybody. I'm not trying to do anything like that whatsoever. So understand where I'm coming from. Because I believe tithing is the way to be financially successful. Yeah. And financially free. Okay? So 1 Corinthians 16.2 says, On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. Save it up so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. And then that's Paul talking about that. Every, every time we gather together, there should be a collection. Now think about this too. If we didn't give out of the abundance of our heart to missions, we'd have no missions. We wouldn't even be talking about Kazakhstan, Gopal, Grenada. We wouldn't, we wouldn't you know... Chip, we wouldn't be talking about Ronette. But I mean, we, we wouldn't talk about anything if, if it, this little church right here wasn't supporting them, right? And the Bible tells us that's above our tithes. It's called offerings. And our offerings support, you can't believe, Lyle and Ingrid and Uganda. All that kind of stuff. All deals with what? I hate to keep telling you, money. So God says, free up. Just let it, don't, don't let it be a little God to you. You talk to the Lord and he'll tell you what to do with it, okay? I'm not going to, okay? So let's go to I, interest. And the word first, I is interest. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Amen. Think about that. Amen. Whether you eat or drink or doesn't matter what you do in life, do it all for the glory of God. At work, at play, everything that you do is for God's glory. It's for His purposes and His plans, not yours. And so when you ask, is God number one in my life, um, He's got to take first place. It's, uh, it's like Proverbs 16.3. Do I have that in your notes there? Is Proverbs 16.3 there? 
Write it down. Put Proverbs 16.3 in your notes where I talk about interest. Put that in there. Because it says this. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and it will what? Succeed. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and it will succeed. I encourage you every single solitary day before you leave your house, Lord, I commit my plans to you today. What are you going to do? I got to go to work. Oh. Well, I commit that plan to you, Lord. May my work be successful. May I be filled with your wisdom. May I be filled with your power. May I be filled with your peace. I commit it to you, Lord. It's yours, not mine. So if we do that alone, you're putting God first before you leave your house. Amen. Why? Because you're thinking about him, right? You're not trying to get anything back. You're not asking for anything. You're saying, I just commit my day to you, my thoughts to you, my plans to you, my ideas. I commit it all to you today, Lord. What are you going to do, Bill? Nothing. <laughs> I'm going to sit at home. Just take it easy. Well, I will tell you this much. I will have an easier day. Amen. I'll be able to relax. Does that make any sense to anybody at all? Okay. So, I mean, that's kind of what I said. So, when it comes to interest, you and I have to have an attitude of gratitude. We have to have an attitude of gratitude. And uh, we want to commit all of our plans to God. And R is for relationships. Okay. The relationships that you and I have. Proverbs 12, 26. A righteous man is cautious in friendships. That's interesting. That happened also. Joe, well, anyway. In a, in a family deal, we were talking about a nice couple. And my son-in-law said, just be cautious. And I thought, interesting. Okay. They seem nice to me. Yeah, but... And I thought, oh, you don't have to tell me anymore. Just be cautious. And so we have to even be cautious in the friends that you and I select. Bad company can do what? Corrupt. Good manners, good habits. Bad company. All right? By the way of the wicked, which leads them astray. So very simply, in relationships, be careful who you choose to be your friends. And often people that say they're your friends aren't necessarily your friends. Okay? So be selective. 1 Corinthians 5, 30, 15, 33. Do not be misled. As I said just a minute ago, bad company corrupts good character. Stay away from the goofballs. I'm serious. There's a bunch of nutbags out there. I mean, seriously. There's some bad characters. Yeah, I, I, to, I told you what I did, which I don't recommend everybody doing it, but so I train at the athletic club three times a week and I train four or five people and there was this one guy and he was coming in and he's kind of foul mouth. And uh, so there was a, he's on this machine and there's a young lady over here and another young lady over here and he starts swearing using the F word. And I said, I kind of yelled at him. I said, uh, you better watch your mouth, man. Shut up. I'm at the club. And then he said, okay, dad. <laughs> Seriously. It's a true story. So sometimes you got to just stand up for what's right in relationships. I don't want to hang around that guy. Don't want to mess around with them. It yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. In fact, when he sees me, he doesn't talk to me. <laughs> so it works real well. <laughs> no, he still says hello and everything. He figured it out. I mean, you know, some people, they're so used to foul language, it's like second nature. They, they just swear left and right. I've told other people, I, mean, I don't need to hear that. I don't need to hear that from you. You know, if you want to talk to me, speak English. You know, I don't need to, don't, don't speak swearing to me, you know. Anyway, again, because bad company corrupts good character. 
you can let that stuff rub off on you if you're not par you got to be careful I'm serious so anyway s is schedule okay Ephesians 5:15 be very careful then how you live not as unwise but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil amen I, I that's unfortunately and it's getting worse it's not going to get better everything's going to get escalate as the end times come so just kind of get used to it understand what's taking place don't panic don't care Armageddon's not here yet but things steadily will become a little bit worse you know you're, you're kind of seeing it uh, all through life so the point I want to make here is uh, might want to write this down too is put God first in your schedule my schedule is set up put God first He's got to be per first in your schedule for that day. And if it's nothing else except quoting Proverbs 16, 3, if that's all the time you have that day for God, at least start with that. Okay? Commit your day. Commit your plans to Him. Spend time. There's got to be time. And let me say this. Write this down too. Make a daily appointment with God. Amen. Amen. Make a daily appointment with God. Uh, I've showed you guys my... This is my calendar. This, there's not much there. Most of it's filled in with schedules, meetings, all this kind of stuff. I told you about up in the corner. Stay focused, stay firm, don't get distracted, etc. But I mean, it's reasonably full. I got things I have to do. But the most important thing I have to do is spend time with God. Amen. The most important. Nothing else, nothing, nothing can take its place. So I personally have a daily appointment with God. I make sure I have time for God because he helps me get through different situations in life. Something will come up that day and I'm so glad I spent time with God because he gives me the answer to something he already foreknows I'm going to have to deal with that I haven't even had to deal with. I'm, I'm still walking through the day and now I'm prepared for something that comes in about five or six hours. Are you, you, is, you, are you with me? And so that's because I spent that time. And T, troubles. Troubles. Psalms 50, 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. I will deliver you. Doesn't matter what you're going through. The Lord will deliver you. I don't care what's happening. You know, you got troubles going on. I would love to have life just flow, be a bowl of cherries, sunshine, about 77 every day. I mean, I'd love things just to go real smoothly, no problems, no nothing. But unfortunately, that's not life. And so the word of God and Psalms again, Old Testament. But it says, hey, man, you're going to have troubles. I want to prepare you for them. I want to prepare you for how to deal with them. And so we have to do what God tells us to do. We have to know that God is first in our life and he'll take care of us. We put him in our, our schedule every single day. He'll take care of us. Amen? He'll watch over us. And I'll tell you something. Worry is an indicator you haven't spent enough time with God. Anytime you worry, you better stop right in your tracks and start praying. Worry is not God's plan for you. Amen. He's setting you free. Amen. Trust in Him in everything, and He'll guide you through. Though I walk through the rivers of the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will what? I'm not going to fear. Man, life is like a roller coaster. It's up and down, back and forth, good times, bad times, dark times, light times. God says He'll always be there. All you have to do in a split second is turn to Him. That's it. Makes good sense, doesn't it? In your time of troubles. My prayer for you this week is that you have no troubles. Now, will God answer that particular prayer? We'll just have to wait and see, won't we? No, you're with me, though. You understand. You understand. So as we continue this study, it's all about God's blueprint for our success in life. The Ten Commandments are there to bless us, not to curse us. The Ten Commandments are there to set us free. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for this time. 
And Father, may not one word fall to the ground, but accomplish the purpose for which you and you alone send it. We just thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, that we could have newness of life, the forgiveness of our sins, and that we could walk in your power, victory, and overcoming. Thank you for all that, Father, and thank you for these guidelines for success in life. Thank you for all of it. And I ask you to bless us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.